Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Charles Breton, and I am the Executive Director at the Institute for Research on Public Policies, Center of Excellence on the Canadian Federation. Very long title. Uh, this event is the sixth in a series created through a partnership between the school and, and the center uh, on contemporary issues in Canadian federalism. I'll just say a few words to introduce today's discussion and then pass it over to your uh, moderator for today. Let me start, however, by uh, acknowledging that the land from which I'm talking to you is the unceded traditional territory of the Ganyan Gehaga. Uh, I recognize that we all work in different places and therefore you work on the different traditional indigenous territory. So please uh, take a moment to consider the first peoples of the land that you're in. Uh, I'm pleased to introduce today's event, Healthcare and Federalism, a hot button issue if there was ever one in this series. Um, so over the course of the series, we've covered several issues in federalism, in federalism and a couple of teams have emerged. So a, a core dynamic within Canadian federalism, and we talked about it during the event on fiscal federalism a bit more, is that provincial and territorial governments may be better placed to understand the specific needs and conditions of their locale, but they're more limited or face more constraints in their ability to generate uh, own source revenue compared to the federal government. And while provinces know their context better, the federal government also wants to make sure that Canadians can enjoy similar quality of services across the country. So today we talk about an area that zero, zeroes in on this tension, healthcare. So healthcare is perhaps one of the most complex and important areas under the purview of governments. It's an, it's an important expenditure for the federal government through transfers specific, especially, and the largest expenditure for provincial and territorial governments. So with the country facing an aging population, labor shortages, and other pressures, there's a necessity to improve the current system to one that is better equipped to endure through these challenges and potential future shocks. There are also historical structural issues that have persisted in the past but been aggravated by the COVID-19 pandemic. We'll explore some of those today. And so to understand how federalism influences the way we approach, we approach the healthcare system, we're going back to first principles in a way. So what makes an effective healthcare system and how does federalism complicate or help that dynamic? What are the different roles of each level of government and the stakeholders they interact with and how do they work or don't? So we'll investigate these questions in today's talk. So we have a great discussion plan for you today and want you to have the best possible experience. So I have a, just a, a few housekeeping items to go over. Uh, so today's event will be in English. Simultaneous interpretation as well as the service of CART. Uh, Real-time captioning is available should you need it and want to follow in the language of your choice. To access these features, please click on their respective icons directly from the webcast interface or you can refer to the reminder email that was sent by the school. To optimize your viewing experience, we recommend that you disconnect from your VPN or use a personal device to watch the, to watch the session when possible. If you're experiencing technical issues, it is recommended to just relaunch the webcast link provided to you. So uh, during the event, you may submit your questions at any time by pressing the text bubble icon located in the top right-hand corner of your screen. We've planned some time for a question and answer period at the end of the session. And so finally, also, we, we, we've turned all of the past events in this series in shorter podcasts. So for those interested, you can find it on our website at irpp.org or uh, on the CSPS event page. So I encourage you to go back and listen if you haven't. So now, uh, without further ado, we will start today's event with our moderator, Joe Voisin. Joe, uh, over to you. Hi, thanks, Charles, and uh, hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Joe or Justine uh, Voisin, and I'm the Assistant Deputy Minister of uh, Strategic Policy Branch uh, at Health Canada. Uh, pleased to be the moderator for today's event, um, and I'm joining you uh, today from the traditional land of the uh, Algonquin Anishinaabe, a land I enjoy very much uh, in cycling and skiing outside, and I hope uh, people enjoy the land on which uh, they live and work as well. Um, so today's event is timely, uh, I think as Shal uh, kind of set up for us, um, healthcare and federalism uh, is uh, playing out and getting a lot of attention uh, these days uh, in the press. And uh, I actually am the ADM responsible uh, for, uh, for healthcare <laughs> um, at, in the federal government. Uh, and so, uh, you know, the recent announcement uh, the federal government made for $198.6 billion over 10 years to provinces and territories to improve the healthcare system. Uh, so part, large part of the policy work uh, that we do here uh, in my branch, uh, and then I lead on, um, as well as uh, all sorts of uh, related uh, health system files. Um, so we know that um, 
you know, that federalism can create a tension uh, between the federal and provincial and territorial governments. We've also seen throughout the pandemic that it's uh, supported a great collaboration. Um, so uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing from two uh, fantastic speakers today uh, who are going to talk to us about these I issues. Uh, so first we have uh, Catherine uh, Furlbeck, um, who is a McCulloch a Research uh, professor and chair of the Department of Political Science uh, at Dalhousie University. And we also have uh, Dr. Haim Bell, uh, who's physician in chief at Sinai Health and professor of medicine and health policy management and evaluation at the University of Toronto. So welcome to both of you. Um, and uh, I'm going to start uh, by turning it over to uh, Catherine, who will be starting us off with a presentation on the structural issues federalism prevents for healthcare, presents for healthcare, um, before we turn it over to uh, both uh, to both of us for uh, uh, Dr. Heim, uh, sorry, to Heim uh, for a brief summary of uh, his experiences uh, with the federal system. Uh, and we'll have, uh, as we noted, questions and answers uh, to follow. So turning it over to you, Catherine. Thanks, Joe. Um, I thank you for your invitation, and I'm quite delighted to be able to chat with you today. And um, I'm also looking forward to your comments and observations, um, especially those of you within the, the healthcare portfolio. I've always thought that it would be good fun to structure a talk around the three questions that I hear most whenever I talk about healthcare federalism. And today I'm going to put that thought into operation. Now, in doing so, I don't mean to disparage those who've asked these questions. On the contrary, these questions are asked because the context involved can be so incredibly complicated and confusing, nor do I intend to insult your intelligence. While the preliminary observations seem fairly obvious, my intent here is to show how these basic observations can become very complicated very quickly. So the first question I get a lot is, why doesn't Ottawa just take over healthcare since the provinces can't seem to get their act together? Well, and of course, all of you know the answer to this one, um, although it's one of the most common questions I get, as well as a very common trope in letters to the editor and in phone-in shows. Um, and I generally just answer with two words, civil war. We, we do have a very important structural constraints regarding what each jurisdiction can and can't do. And of course, the most fundamental of these takes the shape of the Canadian Constitution with its division of powers. Yet, at the same time, it's also not true that the Constitution simply hands health care over to the provinces. The words health care don't actually appear in the Constitution. You know, the closest that we get are hospitals, asylums, charities, and elmosinary institutions in Section 92.7, and that famous catch-all at the end of Section 92 generally all matters of a merely local or private nature in the province, section 9216. The problem, of course, is that healthcare per se is now neither merely local nor private. It's largely public and national in scope, which is in a sense the fundamental irony of the historical development of healthcare in Canada. It was handed to the provinces because it was private and local, although now it's neither. Moreover, much of the provincial authority over healthcare is largely inferred or indirect. So, for example, when provincial healthcare became a, a system with the establishment of public health insurance, it was understood that insurance per se was within the exclusive jurisdiction of the provinces as matters of property and civil rights. So, Section 9213. No matter that health insurance at this point was largely public, while the original intent of 9213 was to regulate the individual contract of private insurance. So another historical irony. And we all know that Ottawa has its own jurisdictional competencies in health related areas. Um, COVID made us very aware, for example, that some of these potential powers, including 9111, uh, gives Ottawa clear constitutional authority over quarantines. Uh, the pandemic also raised the possibility of declaring a national lockdown using the Emergencies Act, which um, is more or less authorized by the Peace, Order, and Good Government Clause of Section 91, although exactly how far Ottawa could take this and for what reasons is perpetually under dispute. Uh, then, of course, there is the practical side of how and when these powers could be deployed. You know, Ottawa could, according to some, have quite legitimately imposed a national lockdown during COVID, 
in the face of uh, provincial recalcitrance, which is fine on the face of it, except, well, exactly how would Ottawa operationalize this when the RCMP represents only about 30% of the police presence in Canada and the federal government is banned from commandeering provincial or municipal police forces. So whether Ottawa has jurisdiction over particular aspects of health governance is one issue and whether it can or even wants to exercise this power, of course, is another thing altogether. Now, most of Ottawa's activity in healthcare, of course, comes from its so-called expenditure power. Except again, there is no explicit expenditure power in the Constitution. It's inferred from its taxation powers under Section 91, which, if you read them, essentially say that Ottawa can tax stuff. And uh, again, constitutional experts love getting to the weeds on this one. So while we think that the constitutional bases for the federal division of powers over healthcare are clearly stated in the constitution, really they're not. Provinces don't explicitly have authority over healthcare and Ottawa doesn't explicitly have the authority to spend tons of money in this area to shape it a certain way. These are simply interpretations of and inferences from archaic and maybe arguably even obsolete um, constructions that we more or less now except through practice. Um, Ottawa also has jurisdiction over uh, pharmaceutical regulation, importantly, by virtue of its authority over patents in uh, 9123, uh, where we saw a very recent dust up at the PMPRB where the debate over constitutional authority played a role. And of course, Ottawa has uh, authority over healthcare provided to the military um, in under section 91.7, where there was a spat a few years ago now, where Ottawa accused the provinces of price gouging on the health services uh, for military personnel that it had contracted out to the provinces. Now, things get even more complicated when modern healthcare takes the form of some mixture of two clear authorities in each jurisdiction. Uh, British Columbia's Insight case is one example where the putative authority over health care um, on the part of the provinces came head to head with Ottawa's power over criminal laws in uh, 9127, I think. Um, another example is the establishment of psychiatric hospitals and penitentiaries. There's a long and very interesting history of provincial and federal governments tossing psychiatric prisoners from federal to provincial institutions and, and vice versa, hospitals are clearly provincial, while well, penitentiaries are clearly federal. So what does one do? And the second question I get a lot is if the Canada Health Act has such a chokehold over healthcare reform, why don't we just change the Canada Health Act? Well, again, we have a fairly few fairly straightforward observations that disintegrate into complexity, I think, within seconds here. The Canada Health Act is, of course, a federal statute that has absolutely no binding authority over provinces, yet it is nonetheless the, the, the glue that binds all the provinces together in, in some semblance of an identifiable national system of health care. Um, and as it has no authority over the provinces, the only way that uh, Ottawa can coax provinces to move one way rather than another is through its federal cash transfers. Now, I know that uh, a lot of you had an excellent presentation on fiscal federalism, so I won't have to go into much depth on this side of things, thankfully. Uh, so let's focus on what the uh, Canada Health Act does or, or does not say regarding the provision of health care, which is somewhat topical right now. So prior to the various pieces of uh, provincial and federal legislation governing public health uh, insurance that emerged from about 1947 um, in the province of Saskatchewan up to about 1972 in Newfoundland. There, prior to this, there was no healthcare system to speak of yet any more than we can really talk about having a, a system of hairdressing or a system of commercial baking, both of which are private endeavors loosely regulated by the provinces, much as healthcare was in the first half of the 20th century. And only when provinces began to have some real skin in the game by virtue of having to pay for services, did they really begin putting their heads to thinking about how to properly organize these services. Now, the debate 
is the extent to which the Canada Health Act in practice determines what the healthcare systems of each province actually look like. So the five famous conditions of the Canada Health Act are actually fairly broad, um, nor do they preclude private health care per se. Yes, they must have a public insurance system in order to receive federal funding, but this doesn't necessarily rule out some form of private insurance or direct private delivery. Uh, people under the Canada Health Act must have access to all medically necessary services insured by the province on uniform terms and conditions. So you, you can't offer these services to, to women, but not men, or to tall people, but not short people. But once you insure this, the question at issue is whether the provinces can offer these, or whether the provinces can allow these services to be offered privately as well. Now, of course, many provinces do. So I guess the question is whether those provinces that do are Canada Health Act compliant or not. And of course, each province has the authority to determine for itself what it considers to be medically necessary. Beyond that, the particular nature of each province's healthcare system is largely determined by provincial legislation. Now, a common and somewhat irritating practice of many journalists is to assume that the, the restrictions that characterize Ontario's healthcare system are true for the rest of, of Canada. This is patently not the case. Ontario, for various reasons, has the most restrictive healthcare system when it comes to access to private services, which is set out in the um, Commitment to the Future Medicare Act of 2004, which essentially bans any physician from opting out of the public system except for those who are grandfathered, which is something that most, if not all, provinces actually do allow. Now, the interpretation letters appended to the Canada Health Act. Uh, currently, there are three of them, although mm, Duclos has just announced that he's going to be tabling a fourth. The interpretation letters are really worth reading in some detail, as they do provide a much clearer sense of the federal intent of the Canada Health Act. Uh, one interesting issue right now are the block fees, where um, a clinic charges, say, a, an annual membership fee before you can access publicly insured services. They're not allowed to do that, according to the App and Marlowe interpretation letters. Another issue is public coverage of all medically necessary diagnostic tests. So since 2020, failing to cover these costs publicly, even if they're provided in private facilities, in, is considered a, a violation of the Canada Health Act according to the Pettipot Taylor interpretation letter. Yet, both of these practices still happen in various provinces. Uh, much of the force of the Canada Health Act rests in section uh, 18 and 19 against extra billing and user fees. So when provinces tolerate these practices, Ottawa is mandated by legislation to levy penalties. However, when provinces transgress other measures outlined in the interpretation letters, Ottawa is not statutorily obliged to levy fines. This is completely discretionary and depends on the desire of the government of the day to follow through. But to understand why private health care takes the form it does in each province, and, and it does vary considerably, you really have to take a hard look at the full panoply of legislation provinces have at their disposal uh, to, to control the level of private health care within their domains. So um, this, this toolbox, if you will, includes whether physicians can opt out of the public system if they want. Again, those in Ontario cannot unless they're grandfathered. Um, many provinces do require those who do opt out of the public system to limit their fees to the public fee schedule, which immediately lowers the potential profitability of any independent private practitioners. But again, not all provinces do this. Um, can patients claim reimbursement for publicly insured services provided by private practitioners? If you look at the legislation, uh, I think in provinces like Newfoundland and, and um, Manitoba, there's some interesting provisions there. Not all provinces prohibit the sale of private insurance of publicly insured services, and some like Quebec sort of allow some but not others. Not all provinces prohibit doctors from working both in the public and the private system at the same time, so-called dual practice. Uh, some provinces prohibit commingling, where, private, where where clinics can hire doctors to work in both the private and the public stream. 
um, but others don't. Um, so the bottom line here is that it is provincial legislation in the first instance and not the Canada Health Act, which determines a province's toleration for private health care activity which is why you get so much finger pointing with each level arguing that the other's legislative framework for healthcare reg regulation is out of date. Now, the third question is my favorite. Um, and this is a question, why can't we all just get along? And here's where columnists and uh, letters to the editor say, well, look, in the end, the taxpayers pay the bills anyway. And when we go to the emergency department, we don't care whether it's provided by the federal or the provincial government. So why don't the governments just stop bickering and do what's right for Canadians? And the problem here is that it's not that governments are short-sighted and focused on petty local concerns, although arguably there's some of that, but rather that it's actually rational to play this kind of political poker. Fiscal capacity, of course, is a large part of the problem. Healthcare is an increasingly expensive program, and Ottawa, as you know, has more relative fiscal capacity than the provinces. So the more financial allocation provinces and territories can squeeze out of Ottawa, the more they see themselves as being able to provide an appropriate level of services to their respective electorates. So, you know, in a sense, they're just doing their job. And the problem here is really that all the respective jurisdictions have an institutional memory of how the federal provincial relationship works and has worked in the past. So this particular federal provincial dynamic isn't really that old, it's younger than I am. Uh, and when Medicare was set up, the, the offer of half price healthcare was too enticing for provinces to ignore. Um, but in the intervening years, the less obvious costs of this kind of relationship quickly became apparent. So for the provinces, the lesson to a large extent was what's easily given is easily taken away from established programs financing in the late 70s to the belt tightening of the 1990s under Martin to the reduced escalator imposed under Harper provinces have learned that they have to be careful what they agree to in the first instance, because if they enter into a cost shared program, Ottawa could well walk away at any moment, leaving them holding the bag. And if their electorates are used to a certain level of services, then they won't be able to pull back without some form of political punishment. And that's precisely why it's so difficult now to establish uh, a new shared cost program like uh, Denticare or, or Pharmacare. You know, the provinces are going, mm, nope, we've learned down, we, we, we've been down this road before, you know, and we've learned and we just don't trust you. And even if we did trust you, we don't know if we could trust your successor. Then there's the issue of size and capacity. Right? Small provinces are, are wary about agreeing to anything that requires a level of fiscal or policy capacity that they don't enjoy. Um, mandated uh, long-term care standards might be one example, right? How is, it a, how is it possible to agree to a certain level of standards that a province isn't sure it can afford? And larger provinces often have the opposite concern that they, they actually do have the capacity to do things well. Um, so why would they want to be part of a, a pan-Canadian process that hobbles their ability to do their own thing in a way that they find both appropriate and effective? Now, at the same time, the uh, frustrations of Ottawa are equally apparent as health transfers simply go into general operating revenues. Increased federal transfers mean more capacity to do all sorts of things, including giving up tax breaks, which then actually limit the ability of a province to raise funds for the same health care it says that it has trouble funding. So the federal skepticism that vastly increased health funding will be used for the wrong purposes is you know, probably well-founded. And even bilateral funding, as currently set up, has such a weak accountability framework that it's it's doubtful that a bilateral strategy is, a, is all that much better than a traditional multilateral one when it comes to accountability. So in some, the... Um, Federal, provincial, territorial dynamics in healthcare are incredibly complicated, and it's difficult enough to 
understand the lay of the land, let alone figuring out how to navigate problem solving, moving through it. I know I've raised probably more questions than I've addressed, so I'm more than happy to dig down into the weeds on any of these topics in the question section. Thank you. Sorry. Oh, hello, sorry. Um, I wasn't supposed to come back, but while Katrin was speaking, um, the alarm went on in Joe's building and she had to evacuate. So now I'm back. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Catherine. That was uh, that was very interesting, and we'll get back to a lot of what you've talked about um, in the discussion that will follow. But now to hear more about underground, how does these dynamic play out to some extent? Uh, we'll turn to Chaim uh, and his own personal experience as a doctor in the healthcare system. So Chaim, over to you, please. Uh, thanks very much, Charles, and uh, and uh, thanks very much, Catherine. Um, I, and hopefully Joe is okay, and we we can maybe regroup with her after uh, after the uh, alarm is over. Um, so I, I think the the we partly when we when we developed this uh, program, we wanted to have a little bit of foundational knowledge, which which Catherine so adeptly provided. I'm just going to give a little bit of my background so you understand a little bit of my perspective on things. And I think a lot more of the fun and opportunity will, will come when we uh, ha have uh, respond to the questions uh, that should be coming from you. So just a, a quick thing. Um, I'm a uh, physician. Uh, I'm a general internal medicine physician, sort of a hospital-based physician who looks after hospitalized patients at uh, Sinai Health. I've uh, um, been uh, on the front lines of uh, both SARS uh, in 2003 and uh, most recently on the front lines as well as a leadership role uh, during uh, the pandemic. So I've, uh, that's the type of uh, medicine that, that I've given, um, that I provide. I've also, from a leadership perspective, um, our hospital and our department were one of the ones that provided both inpatient care as well as intensive care unit uh, care for um, for pandemic patients, just to give you a little bit of a taste. Um, from my perspective on, on things, um, I have a bit of a lens and experience with the healthcare system, both from an international perspective, more in an academic realm, uh, through the VA uh, in the United States of Veterans Affairs, which is really a, a quite a large, uh, almost universal uh, healthcare system in, in the uh, United States, uh, arguably the largest, depending on on how you categorize certain things, and with um, with uh, fellowship training programs. Uh, as well, I've been involved with uh, training programs in other countries, including in Israel. A at the federal level, uh, I'm the uh, chair of the uh, um, of the Council for Canadian Academies. Um, uh, we have a uh, health um, data. Um, it's a it's a report that we're bringing forward on uh, health data sharing, uh, an expert panel to try and improve that within Canada, and that's supposed to move forward from a, through a policy uh, response. I was also one of the um, uh, the the first um, members of the Pan Canadian Oncology Drug Review, which kept which uh, was devised to uh, try and standardize and and apply a Pan Canadian approach to a drug uh, to oncology drug. Um, funding approvals across the country. Uh, I've been on many um, panels and uh, committees associated with the Canadian Institutes of Health Research from uh, the CIHR. And uh, I've also been involved with uh, um, FNIB consultations, uh, looking at health data from a federal perspective. From a provincial perspective, my focus has really been in Ontario, but also in uh, some other provinces, uh, you, including Alberta, and uh, British Columbia looking at the uh, drug funding and the uh, grant panels. Um, in Ontario, I've looked at panels associated with drug funding on a provincial basis, as well as health technology uh, funding on that provincial basis. Uh, in, as well, I was um, involved in the Ontario uh, government through as a consultant to the health quality branch, and as well with negotiations with the Ontario, Min Ontario Medical Association, um, and uh, coverage of rare drugs. 
finally, at the local level, I've, I've spoken a bit about my clinical responsibilities, but I'm also the chief of medicine at Sinai Health, uh, and uh, I, we have a lot of interaction with the University of Toronto. So it's a, it's a long and short of way of saying that um, what I bring to the table here and what we're trying to, to apply is, as Catherine said, it's a, it's a morass of overlapping um, frameworks and overlapping um, uh, legal applications on how we're delivering um, healthcare. Uh, and I, we can reflect on a whole host of them on how it works in the regular world, how it's worked during a pandemic perspective, and how it's work, how it, how we think it might work in the future, uh, and then talk about some of the challenges, which, as Charles pointed out, I think has really been laid bare during the pandemic. But it's, it's in a sense, it's nothing that we hadn't identified or anticipated. It just accelerated and catalyzed a lot of what we were about to see. So anyway, it's just a way of, uh, of bringing that forward. And I look forward to uh, trying to respond to many of your questions. And uh, hopefully Catherine can do a better job than me at that. Um, thank you, Chaim. Uh, so on this, I mean, I want to uh, let's 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 deal with the uh, the pandemic right away and, and, and jump in it uh, and maybe perhaps at two different levels. Uh, and I'll, uh, I'll start with you, um, uh, Catherine from your experience and seeing how provinces and the federal government interacts interact on healthcare, you talked about the funding aspect and the fiscal aspect, talking about how it wasn't always this way, but it's been this way for a while, how they fight over a few of those things. Would you say that uh, qualitatively, quantitatively, the relationship between the provinces and the federal government were much different during COVID? There was much more relationship, much more discussion. But would you also say, do you see, did you see a, a qualitatively different relationship that may perhaps can can continue, or are we back to our old ways uh, already in terms of how the provincial and federal government uh, talk to each other on this file? Okay, so two questions there. Uh, first, there was a qualitatively different kind of relationship. Whether it continue, whether it can continue along those lines, no, I doubt it. Um, and there was um, a, a, a large degree of uh, pulling together. And I think what we learned from previous pandemics, both SARS, but more importantly, H1N1, was that the messaging had to be consistent. And I think there was uh, a lot of attention played to that, arguably to a fault, that there was very little room for debate over scientific uh, data uh, allowed. But again, there was an important um, convergence in the official line, which helped. Uh, one thing that was rather interesting during COVID was uh, the fact that there were some little um, spats between provinces themselves. And of course, as you know, Nova Scotia and uh, New Brunswick, I guess all the, the Atlantic provinces uh, closed their borders. And there was a certain amount of disagreement regarding when they should be opened. Um, so it had some provinces opening their borders, but the other province refused to uh, open theirs in, in the same way. So that caused a little bit of, uh, you know, friction. Um, it is, I think that having a federal system uh, was in a way helpful during COVID insofar as uh, the COVID response could be more cleanly tailored to a certain geographic area. And again, as a inhabitant of Nova Scotia, um, I was uh, quite aware that we enjoyed a lot of normal activity where Quebec and Ontario were locked down for much longer periods. Had there been a national response, I think we would have suffered needlessly um, because of that. So I think being able to tailor uh, COVID responses to geographical areas was quite helpful. Um, and I, again, a lot of us are doing forensic analyses of how provinces responded to the pandemic. Looking forward to God help us the next one coming down the pipeline. And uh, it is absolutely fascinating to see how each response was very 
tailored to a province in terms of the protocol for testing and what have you. So it will be interesting in the next year or so to be able to analyze these responses to see how well they worked. And, you know, provinces can look to each other to see, you know, whether there's something that they could have done better to see. Again, Nova Scotia did a lot of pop up testing, a lot of rapid testing, more so than other provinces. Was this useful? Was this helpful? Is this something that other provinces ought to do? So getting back to this almost this old cliche of uh, federalism, really an incubator for new practices. I think that COVID sort of borne that out. At the same time, there's a lot of discussion about the difficulty in data communication. Um, we had, of course, the, the whole issue in SARS Mark I about uh, provinces' inability to send uh, data to Ottawa in a timely manner, which caused the World uh, Health Organization to uh, uh, shut down uh, Toronto as a, as a global uh, travel destination. And we thought we'd learned from that, but of course we hadn't. And that's a much deeper issue that still hasn't been resolved. Um, you know, hopefully provinces will be able to negotiate uh, something with Ottawa before the next um, pandemic uh, comes rolling along. But uh, that's still a practice uh, that has to be sorted out. And so I'm on this, I mean, again, I think at the level of discourse between uh, the, the the leaders, uh, I think I would agree with Katra that we're back to old ways, but we, one would hope that behind the scenes, um, there were lessons learned during COVID that are still being applied. Uh, so I'm curious to know if that's the case. And especially you talked about your, your involvement um, on the data side. One would hope again, like Katrin said, that perhaps we didn't learn, we did not learn lesson from the SARS um, uh, uh, crisis. Uh, on that side, uh, uh, one would hope that now we 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 have. So I'm curious on your side. Do you feel like some of the some of the good good things that COVID brought in terms of how we interact with each other uh, 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 and our provinces and the federal government interact with each other uh, is is still with us, or are we are we back to how we were working before? It's it's interesting you brought up the um, the original SARS uh, in two thousand and three because uh, the you know, the classic Naylor report with David Naylor who was the dean of uh, the University of Toronto Medical School at the time called for a few um, important uh, changes to come about one of which interestingly was the Public Health Agency of Canada which played a, a role in in this pandemic which wasn't present really in the in the in the uh, in 2003 so we did we did have an in, an important federal change uh, to the the constituents um, and leaders at the time where we didn't have before we, we didn't have a Teresa Tam to the same extent last time with that with that same platform it was a little bit it was different but it, it wasn't that to that same extent so there were some important um, there were some important changes. I mean, partly it, these the the they're only as good as the relation the personal relationships between the people, right? And some of it uh, had to do with if you looked at many of the leaders in the provinces or the 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 chief medical officers of health, there was a lot of change that happened even during the three years that was ongoing. Uh, so you know that just from that sort of. Um, organizational framework. The, the other aspect from an organizational framework is that because the public health is different than the delivery of health care in Canada. And mm -hmm. we have to also recognize that, that there are, there are different laws that Catherine can probably speak about much more eloquently than me, really re, um, dealing with public health and, and the public health um, specific uh, requirements. And it's, it's a different setting. Most of us are f much more familiar with healthcare delivery or health or, you know, receiving healthcare in a hospital, in a clinic. And that's often what the discourse is. And, and we're not as familiar with public health and public health is, it, it's one of these things that you might say, if you've seen one public health system in Canada, you've seen one public health system in Canada, they're different depending on the provinces. And I think here we can all, we can pro pretty, um, uh, reliably say that form follows function, so that you know what we see, what we saw in Quebec with the way they organize healthcare and public health is far different than the way we would see it in Canada, in in Ontario, but mostly the rest of Canada as well. So Quebec has, in my opinion, much more of a of a um, a progressive approach to it, using regional using regional. Um, approaches that that are melded. Alberta has gone through different iterations of this for as an example. Uh, but Ontario had 
you know, you, you have, as an example, in Ontario, you had, I think it was 34 different public health areas with who weren't necessarily, and I don't know why I'm going in and out of focus, but I'm not trying, nothing's <laughs> happening here. Um, at 30, something like 34 public health areas where um, the, each of the public health, each of the chief public health officers for those those small regions, didn't report directly to the chief medical officer of health, who was supposed to be the chief public health officer for the province. So they couldn't, in a sense, they weren't accountable to them. So it, when you have that type of organizational framework, you're not going to be, even if there's a good relationship between the province and the federal government, there's no, it doesn't trickle down the same way where you have people, where you have different health regions able to respond differently. That's just an example from Ontario. It, it just, you know, just sort of copy and paste this across the provinces. And you'll see that, that even if we're sort of all rowing in the same, you know, this, the same direction, it's not going to be last for long. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that was, that's been the resounding um, feeling is that the, it, the organizational framework is inconsistent across the provinces. And in a way, and, and I, I guess, Catherine, that's a, a question for, for you uh, to some extent. Is there, is one of the issue here that there isn't um, any kind of institutional framework for people to have those discussions? So for instance, see, knowing that there are 13 different uh, healthcare system in Canada and 13 different public health system, there isn't a clear way or institution where people can learn what works in what works and what doesn't, or like, yes, everyone can, can I, uh, come with innovation and see what works and what doesn't, but we cannot, we don't communicate uh, across uh, 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 those, those different um, uh, um, healthcare system to really learn from one another. And perhaps that's a role for the federal government to play. Well, I'm not quite so sure about that. It really depends what area of healthcare you're talking about, because there are you know, discrete um, FPT groups looking at particular um, aspects of the healthcare system. And I think a lot of discussion goes on there. Um, and also when a province wants to find out uh, about how another province does something, it will make an effort to do so. So when Nova Scotia wanted to centralize and amalgamate its health authorities, it went to Alberta and had a long discussion there. So where there is a will, there is a way um and it's not just a, a matter of learning about best practices uh, even when there's a sense of what other provinces do often there's not a will to uh to take up these new practices uh, there's always the perpetual argument um that uh, provincial health authorities are not big risk takers and even knowing about uh, a different way of doing things doesn't mean that they're willing to implement it mm -hmm. so it's it, it's there can be better communication um i think if you look at the european union uh, as a as a political whole there's a lot more institutionalization of these little groups of these agencies who have who are actually funded by the central authorities so in the European Union, the uh, Brussels, uh, as a, the, the federal uh, leader, is uh, mandated by the um, by the constitutional uh, treaty, the TFEU, to assist uh, any member state uh, on any um, healthcare undertaking if they want. So the federal government actually has to get involved when the regional entities want to. And it would be very useful to have something like that in Canada because we do have the Council of the Federation, but often when there is a desire of provinces to work together, they don't have the capacity, they don't have the policy capacity, they don't have the infrastructure to really sit down and, and work things through in any depth. So we could do things better, but, uh, but there is some uh, communication. Is there so okay and and um, uh, that's 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 good to know. Um, so in terms of healthcare governance, again, we talked about COVID and we've looked back, and so let's just just look ahead in a way, and perhaps COVID highlighted some of those um, uh, upcoming challenges. So when it comes to healthcare governance and, and healthcare delivery, what are uh, in 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 your mind, both of you, uh, really the main challenges that we're facing? It we know about population aging. 
Um, we know that also one problem for the Federation is that population population aging is not exactly the same, is not a problem to the same extent across the country, much more important in Atlantic Canada than it is in Alberta, for instance, that is a younger province. Uh, labor shortages, like those are the two that come in, that come up uh, uh, most of the time. Is there any, like, are these really the main challenges that we face ahead? Is there anything else that, that, that the Federation needs to really look into? Um, perhaps again, information sharing, it was something that the, the COVID-19 highlighted as, as perhaps one place where, uh, uh, the country as a country could, could, could do better. Um, so in your mind, what are those really main challenges ahead and how can we respond to them as a federation not as 13 different ent entities trying to deal with those massive um, challenges ahead maybe i'll start first is Catherine. so you know health human resources is probably it's probably one two and three on what's presenting now um these go back for many many years to cuts to medical school, but it's not just medical school, right? This has been, this is uh, nursing, an aging workforce in nursing. There have been um, a lot of uh, gains in certain areas where we've been shifting from hospital-based care to home-based care, and we haven't had that same shift in the, um, in the workforce for those people. Uh, where I see the issues are often in connections with that H, with that health human resource file. I'll give you an example, um, and this is probably pertinent to the the federal government more than anything. Is if you we we have targets. I think you know depending on where which numbers you you believe, somewhere between four hundred and five hundred thousand new immigrants are supposed to come to Canada every year for the next five years. Okay, in Ontario alone, we've got about a million and a half people without a family doctor. That's just sort of basic, if, we, if we're looking at the organizational framework. Assuming that a third to a half of those people come to Ontario, how, how, is, that going to inter, how is that going to interdigitate with a healthcare system that's already failing, right? Where you've got more people. Now, rec I'm not saying anything about the health of immigrants. And in fact, we know from data that, that immigrants as a whole, immigrants to Canada are usually healthier and, um, and better educated, of course. But that still means that they still require a family doctor. They still require um, uh, health resources. And, and if we're looking at it from that perspective, uh, the, the idea of, of saying, how can we, you know, there's a reason why we're looking for uh, increasing our population with immigration, but how does that impact health? That that I think, it, you know, if you use that lens to anything with anything with uh, within the purview of federal governments, that's one of the things that we we really need to think of is how, we already a stressed system. How is this going to stress us more, and how can we help? You know, the corollary is who, who's holding the the clipboard that says. Who you know, may, many of those immigrants that we should bring in are people that we should bring in who are in the health field, directed to nurses and such. And in order to do those things, you, you almost need somebody in charge that's identifying. I'm not sure, and and I could be very wrong, but it hasn't been clearly communicated, at least to me, of you know, of those four or five hundred thousand, how many of them are going to be nurses or doctors? or technicians that are going to be helping us. That, that to me, would be that, that whole idea about rowing in the same direction, where, we, where you're able to have a concerted approach to things, where that you would have the, and it, this isn't, you know, before we were talking about federal health and, and provincial health authorities. Here, it's not, you know, it's not even that, it, it's, they're different um, entities and different disciplines, but really they're really interrelated. And I think if we get it right, wow, that would be amazing. But when we don't get it right, that just adds to our problems. Uh, Catherine. Yeah, I'd, I'd uh, echo that absolutely. Health human, uh, health human resources is the biggest issue right now. And part of the problem in terms of federalism is that each region has different capacities, so you're not talking about uh, equivalent players. So there has been a lot of discussion about national licensure, which can be helpful in allowing medical professionals to move more easily across borders. 
but once you have some jurisdictions having much more fiscal capacity to attract them, that is not going to be a particularly attractive proposition to some of the provinces. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, just the other day, Alberta announced that, uh, for want of a better word, it was quite happy to poach uh, healthcare work with some of the provinces. Uh, we have a major issue in the Maritimes at keeping paramedics here because their uh, scale of, of uh, reimbursement is so much higher in other provinces. So it's all well and good to say, well, we have to have greater mobility and that the federal government can facilitate this mobility. But really, who are the winners here and who are the losers here? And, you know, some of the small uh, provinces with the smaller economies are going, it doesn't look good. And again, I can use the European Union as a, as a parallel here. So you know, over a dozen years ago, um, the laws were changed to allow medical professionals to work within the EU, to work anywhere within the EU. And I remember being in Brussels and talking to uh, a Romanian um, uh, pers uh, healthcare uh, official and I asked her what effect that had on her. She just shook her head and said, well, we lost one third of our healthcare workers because we just can't afford to pay them. I thought mm, that could be Nova Scotia. So, you know, what is a solution to one jurisdiction uh, is a major problem uh, for another jurisdiction. And another issue, of course, is not just licensure, but you have to understand that it's for a lot of um, professions such as pharmacists and uh, nurse practitioners who are playing a much greater role now. If you look at their scopes of practice, they vary tremendously across all provinces, right? So there's not a good sense of what a nurse practitioner should be allowed to do across the country. It's very specific to a particular province. And um, as part of the health human resources, I'd say, you know, one thing that we should have a national discussion about, not in terms of imposing solutions, but in terms of discussing best practices and models, is uh, primary um, health care provision. You know, how do we set up primary health care homes? How do we uh, reimburse them? Of course, you know, some provinces rely more on fee-for-service, and then we have alternative payment plans. We have a move toward primary care networks networks or collaborative care clinics in all provinces in different ways. But again, uh, the kind of what we mean by collaborative care clinics varies tremendously. It can be, you know, um, the, the government giving resources to physicians, GPs to hire uh, cognate health professionals, healthcare professionals. You can have co-leadership models where you have healthcare uh, other healthcare professionals working alongside of GPs in a clinic, or you can have a turnkey model in which the province hires on a salary basis both physicians and other healthcare professionals. And it's very harem scarum now. There's not, I mean, every province is experimenting with this, and there's not a good sense of what works and what doesn't. And I think it would be very useful to have Ottawa facilitate a national conversation in what works and what doesn't in terms of primary health care um, uh, design. Um, that's very interesting. And, and Catherine, I think that your point, the point that you made about how a solution that might be appealing to Alberta or Ontario uh, might not appeal to Nova Scotia or PEI, for instance, and that that's something that's important to keep in mind here. Uh, and again, maybe that's somewhere where federalism in a way complicates things. So I get two more questions and then we'll turn to questions uh, um, uh, from the, the other people that are with us. There are uh, uh, a lot of those questions coming in. So again, so this might highlight again where a place where federalism is, is more a hindrance than anything, but I'd like to, maybe we can we can try to talk about federalism in a positive way and see why, like in, in your view, in terms of whether it's governance or delivery, um, places or a role that in a way that where federalism actually is something that's useful that's helpful we've talked about policy learning so maybe that's one are there any other aspects of again uh the governance of healthcare or or the delivery of healthcare where we we can see where federalism actually acts as 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 an enabler as something that makes things um maybe more efficient or easier or maybe there isn't but i i put the question to you i don't know who wants to take on that that first maybe it's a it's a difficult question Catherine, do you want to start sure um okay so policy learning is a, a major aspect of at least in the theory of of um what what works and it, it's not just learning what works well but what to avoid as mm -hmm. well i think we have to keep in mind um but another aspect of federalism is again, both theoretically and I think in practice, is that it is more responsive to the particular 
values of a particular population. Um, you know, do we want more private health care? Do we want to uh, make sure that we don't have uh, a certain level of private health care? Uh, in COVID, we saw this, I think, quite substantially in that certain provinces were very intolerant of too much, um, you know, lockdown, too many lockdown measures, and in other provinces, uh, the, the 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 sensibility of the of the population was that you know, provinces were lifting restrictions too quickly. Um, so, just in terms of ease of governance, uh, it's you know, it's healthcare governance is never an easy file, but it, the more defined a population you have. I think the easier it is for a government to respond to the particular needs, but also the sensibilities of a population, which, as you know, in Canada are very, very different. Jaime, anything to add on, on this point? You, you're saying what works with the federalism. Uh, you know, I, some of the things I think work, you know, there you could debate how well they work, but within it, um, drug and uh health technology or device assessment is done at a federal level in the healthcare sphere. Um, that's, that's one of the, the, the big issues that, you know, you wouldn't want that those approvals to be done on the, on the provincial basis. It's, it's not, you know, the, the, it's, it's hard enough in a small country like Canada to have the expertise for that. Uh, that would be, that would be something I would say in, in healthcare that, you know, that, that would be, um, something important. Uh, vaccines are along those same lines. It's just like a drug. And we can talk about how, uh, just at least during the, the recent pandemic, how that that helped us out from a from a, a Canadian, a federal perspective as compared to, you know, normally purchasing through individual drug manufacturers would have would have really um, affected our our purchasing power and the and the the speed of which we would have access to things. So that that's you know it it definitely in those situations it certainly helps the smaller provinces uh, more uh, where they might not have the same level of expertise or purchasing power. And th there have been some very good recent um, efforts, particularly in the drug sphere, where there's a concerted effort to try and purchase it purchase. Um, medications, prescription medications, uh, from a, a federal perspective, um, they've looked at it, 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 they've had, they've had a few test cases that have gone quite well. Um, so, you know, the CDAC file and CADF, those are the two, uh, CADF is within, uh, sorry, CDAC is within CADF. Uh, that's, you know, they've taken on a, a larger role in this sphere. Um, Health Canada, of course, uh, from the from the licensing aspect, I think, and and that was certainly brought to the forefront during the pandemic more than we had, you know, no one no one would know who you know, you, you wouldn't know that that the that the committee existed, much less all the people on the committee who uh, who determine um, whether the vaccines are coming or not, and you know, here you know who the consultant is. How, you know, how how quickly they're they're reviewing things you know it really was sort of an inside baseball of the processes but I, I think those would be the the ones I would I would look at there have been a lot of national commissions but they, they haven't been tied to accountability frameworks and I think that's that's sometimes the challenge with um, with federal versus provincial mm-hmm if I can just follow up on that, I, I agree completely with him that uh, that uh, drug uh, evaluation through bodies like uh, CADF, which is technically federal in the best possible sense of a joint collaborative uh, activity between Ottawa and the provinces, I, mean, I think that really is a success story. Um, but uh, also, the, what are the drawbacks uh, of a federal system in terms of pharmaceuticals is that drug companies tend to play provinces off against each other, right? They are able to get one province to, to cover a particularly expensive drug. And then the campaign starts. So, you know, this province covers, this province cares about their citizens, but your provincial government won't won't carry our drug. So obviously your, your government doesn't care about you. And, and these kinds of uh, very you know, nefarious activities are much more uh, easy in, in a federal uh, system and also the pricing of drugs, which you know we're we're getting toward the, uh, we're, we've addressed that to a certain extent with the Pan Canadian Pharmaceutical Alliance, but yeah, a lot more work can be done there. And then, you know, if we could have a national formulary, I think it might help as well. 
but uh, pharmaceuticals absolutely important and both pros and cons of uh, what goes on in the federal system. Um, very, very interesting. That's an area that I did not uh, know very well. Uh, so before we we go to the question, one last one for me. Um, so we've we've talked about. I think both of you highlighted how um, human resources is really like the, the challenge of today, right? Even yesterday, perhaps. Uh, so it's the one that's closest to us. But um, I was wondering if there was anything else uh, uh, that wasn't getting as much attention and in, in, in that you're concerned about in the healthcare system, something that you foresee as, as becoming an issue, but perhaps one that we we don't talk about as much uh, coming out of, of, of COVID. Again, uh, I think labor shortages is really something that, you know, Canadians experience uh, uh, on a daily basis now, uh, but perha perhaps there are other things that might not be as important as labor shortages, uh, but that you see it, that that you're that you're somewhat concerned about uh, um, in 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 the coming future. So perhaps Chaim, I'll start with you on this one. Uh, sure. Uh, um, you know, I I always go back. I'm I'm not a primary care provider, mm -hmm. but I think primary care is they're the the bedrock and the foundation of our healthcare system. Uh, and I think we the investment in primary care and the connection with primary care is, is something that really hasn't been moved up um, on people's radar. I think that it's, it's, it's part and parcel of the health human resources. It, it goes to, it definitely goes together, but I think the, the idea that Primary care is organized in multiple different ways in 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 province in between and within the same province. That that's that's a challenge. Uh, so it's inconsistent. I think the fact that so many people don't really have good access to primary care will just compound any of the inequities we have. The people that tend not to have access to primary care are often the people who we know can have um, adverse outcomes or or worse outcomes um, for a variety of other reasons so that they might be vulnerable for other reasons as well. So the, the I would I would emphasize that primary care aspect in addition to the health human resources, but I, I, I see them as sort of parts of the same mm -hmm. um, uh, manifestation, but I think we, we want to single out primary care for sure as uh, as something that if you don't have it, you, ha you you're not you're not going to perform as a healthcare system. Mm -hmm. Catherine. Catherine. Yeah, uh, you did mention data and the collection of data and the communication of data and the you know the publication of data as being an issue, and that I would say it r runs a close second. Um, the state of national uh, health data in Canada. I mean, Kaiha is doing a wonderful job as it as it is, but the uh, uh, the ability to access uh, important data in real time is a national embarrassment. You, you, I mean, there's been this ongoing uh, discussion internationally about excess deaths and you know the level of excess deaths across various countries and what it, what causes it. And then you look to Canada and you, data stops like six months ago and you have no idea what's going on. And you go to conferences and they have, oh, here's the Australian data, here's the British data, and here's Ontario's data because you just can't find Canadian data for this, that, or the other. So, you know, they, and there's so many, so many issues involved with data collection. There's the technical issue that I can't even wrap my head around. And then there's sort of the political side of things where certain provinces just don't like the idea of giving up their control um, regardless of anything else. And then there are the real limitations imposed by um, laws that require provinces to be responsible for the privacy, uh, the protection of privacy for their, for their population. So you can see that they want to be very careful about the kinds of data that they share and so on and so forth. So it data sharing has been a huge mess. And there are, again, there are all these different initiatives on the part of the federal government and also you know, provinces uh, to try to address that. And I'm crossing my fingers that we're going to get somewhere on that one. Um, another major issue, of course, is the upstream determinants of health. Um, mm -hmm. So I think to a large extent, and we pump so much money into public health, which is a great thing, but a lot of it has been focusing on disease surveillance and disease um, mitigation. And 
uh, I'm worried in a way that less attention and maybe fewer resources are being put toward concerns of population health. So nutrition, obesity, smoking, alcoholism, uh, opioid use, what have you. I mean, are we going to focus so much on the, the disease surveillance aspect of, of public health that we lose sight of these very important and actually these very expensive uh, trends that if left unaddressed um, are just going to exacerbate the existing tensions that we have in our healthcare system. Of course, there's more. I mean, long-term care, again, is another one. Um, if you look at countries that do long-term care right, I mean, they've made a sizable national investment. Uh, so the Netherlands, for example, I mean, people do pay um, a, a hefty amount um, out of their paychecks every month. Uh, for their long-term care. And when they retire, they expect to get damn good long-term care. So they don't, and of course, because long-term care is is so uh, sustainable, they don't have the same kinds of pressures uh, with alternative level of care in their hospitals as we do. So getting long-term care right is a, another piece in the puzzle. But again, because it is so decentralized, where do you start? And, and I have to say thank you, Catherine, because I'm the chair of the looking at it for health data sharing, and you're wow. the one who brought it up. So even better. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, I totally concur with that. And if you even even if you look at it, how quickly we got data, it depended on the province. Um, and when we did get data, we were able to overcome some of those challenges temporarily, of course, at least in Ontario and some of the other things where we looked at our Ontario science table. It was able to change the way that we changed, you know, we looked at the data on how, you know, the how quickly or, or the, the length of time between uh, vaccines. And we were also able to prioritize them to high needs areas, high needs neighborhoods at the neighborhood level, depend with some of the quick data that was coming back. And normally, as Catherine said, we're you know, you're you're a year and a half out before you've even before you've even analyzed the data, so it, we don't have the same dashboards that other people would have, and, and we're always comparing ourselves to the states. And I would say that that's the wrong comparison. <laughs> and I think that if you take anything away from this, that that's our natural person to compare, right? We're always looking over our shoulder mm. and looking, you know, but that's the wrong thing and that will only put us in the that will only make us put it lull us into complacency because we're better we might be better in some things than some people that in the united states but we we you know if you look at europe if you look at something like uh, uh, australia with a similar type of you know states they use states but the the provincial federal divide they're they're able to get that um before us and they're able to sort those things out that we haven't seemed to sort out yet. So uh, I would encourage if anybody in the public service is looking, don't, you know, the US might be a political comparator for the political parties, but if we wanna get better, that's not the comparator that we wanna, we wanna use. So, so I, I was going to ask a question on data sharing before you both mentioned it, because it was, it was a question from the audience. There's one part of that question that I think we can we can try our and we can try answering, though I'm not sure we'll have a final answer on it. But uh, part of that question that that person was asking is, uh, so it seems to be a, a big issue. It seems to have big implications for the, the quality of care and access to care. So what what is needed to improve data sharing in the country like what is it that will solve a problem here uh in terms of of better data sharing in in uh across jurisdictions oh, is, I'm do, do we have an answer do we know this one. <laughs> take it away uh yeah it, you know what 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 isn't needed is really the the other question it it a lot of this is attitude. You know, everybody mm -hmm. says, um, oh, it's just a privacy thing. If we get the private, if we just, if it just weren't for those blank privacy commissioners, this would be fine. That's not the case. A lot of the issues, uh, it, it really is that we partly, partly that we don't want it enough and mm -hmm. we're not willing to overcome those things. Um, we're not over, as Catherine said, there's a lot of, you know, it's some of it's cultural. The idea that you're not you're, you're not sharing. What am I getting out of it? Some of it is actually that we're not able to access some of the things in certain provinces. Uh, we haven't designed it. Um, 
it becomes a political minefield to try and to try and identify some of those things. Um, but I, I think it's got to take a multi-pronged approach, and 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 it and it has to be done by where people can see what the benefits are. Right? Mm -hmm. This isn't an academic exercise and just saying, oh, wouldn't we? Won't we feel better when we go to the OECD? And you know, then it's not just one province in comparison to all these countries, it, it's the whole country. That That's not the, 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 the idea is I think once people see how the data can inform and improve your care and, and help you make the right decisions, that that's part of, and that's partly what we're trying to do with our, with what we're um, putting forward with, with the, the Council of Canadian Academies is to identify, you know, they recently came up with um, a report on the cost of mis misinformation, right? What is all the conspiracy theories and such? What did, how, what did that cost people? And what did that cost be us just in, in, in health? And, and that's part of what we're, we're looking at. It's not just, you know, wouldn't it be good to have this? It's how does it cost us? How does this hamper us? How does this keep us back from improvement? Um, and and that's what we're you know that's that is what we're hoping we'll be able to to change the minds rather than just sort of saying you know our we're pursuit of data data is a good thing more data if if some data is good more data is better it's how would you know how look how you would have been better off had you had this information mm -hmm. to make this decision or if you had this decision you wouldn't have had you wouldn't have made this incorrect decision um the you know you look and look how much it costs you either in time money all sorts of things so i think i think underscoring the value of the data sharing making making it apparent that the people that everybody benefits from that sharing of data from benchmarking and that it doesn't look like a punitive thing i think that's the other thing people are often worried that if if the, the data can only work against me right you know mm. why would i ever want to evaluate this government pilot program because if it's good we'll get more money for it if it didn't work then um it could only be you know it can only work against me politically um and i think we need to get over that that it's not it's not a shame and blame idea and that this is this is used for improvement and 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 mo and modifications right it doesn't mean it's an all or nothing it can mean that we need to modify it and improve it uh, and still keep it um, and uh, so a related question to that one, and, and this time I'll go to the political scientist to answer it. Um, so, uh, and, and a very current question that describes well uh, the last few months. So a lot of the healthcare discussion is punting around the responsibility between different jurisdictions. Is there a solution that can be implemented or is there a solution to the finger pointing that goes on uh, on this file? And, and I'll add, even from a citizen's point of view, in terms of accountability, that makes it difficult, right? The accountability of who's responsible for this mess that I'm that I'm that I'm looking at. Like if I want to punish this government, is, is am I is it the federal government that I want to vote against? Is it the provincial? Like even in terms of accountability, it makes it difficult for a cit for, for, for citizens uh, 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 to 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 keep the government accountable. So is there a solution? to that to that finger pointing between jurisdiction on the health file okay short answer no um <laughs> longer answer um but when you talk about data sharing who, data sharing between whom i mean at one level it is about uh, the sharing of data uh, between the pr provinces and the federal government and also between the provinces. But at a much more fundamental level, it is making uh, critical data more accountable to everyone. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, you know, this is the tack that Ottawa is trying to take with the provinces uh, in order to you know, leverage its its investment in uh, federal transfers a bit more is to say, well, we want you to be more accountable, not to us per se, but to your populations. And any health researcher who's tried to get, you know, data out of a province knows that it's, you know, it is a very difficult task. And you know that, you know, in, in some cases, provinces aren't collecting data. I mean, only recently have we really begun to think about race-based data. Um, so that's fairly new. But in other uh, senses, like COVID, we were just swimming in data. We're very data rich, um, but then there's not the capacity to uh, go through the data, to crunch the data. So sort of the, the data 
data is there in a raw form, but we just don't have the the, the capacity to, to to use it. Um, and then you know, even if a government did have the ability to sit down with the data and go through it, to what extent would it be willing to share this information with its own population? And of course, you know, provinces differ um, across the board on and, and how open they are. And it's, you know, to a certain extent, the answer, how do you get problems to be accountable? Well, populations, electorates have to demand um, that provinces account for what they're doing. So they, uh, a province will uh, come up with a new policy proposal. Um, and if you look at what like a, um, a request and recommendation form that a lot of provinces use, uh, part they have an appendix that says, well, how would you evaluate explain how you would evaluate whether this policy works or not. And I would love to be able to access, but but there's no way, even probably with a, a FOIA pop, I don't think that uh, I could get this information. So the information, the data is out there, the data, kinds of data that I want to be able to know whether provinces are, um, whether the, the kinds of policies they've enacted are actually useful kinds of policies. We don't know because the provinces won't share this data with us. Like, I don't care if they share it with Ottawa. I want them to share it with me. Hmm. And, you know, getting that is really like pulling teeth. And of course, you know, as a former premier uh, said in the podcast, you know, when it comes to election time, you know, um, transparency and, you know, uh, and very you know, vague governance issues are just not what governments run on. They 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 run on you know um, how many people are are in uh, stretchers in in hospitals and how many people die in an emergency ward and how many how long you have to wait for for a paramedic. I mean these are the kinds of things that people want. So governments won't respond to these vague you know transparency and governance issues because people don't force it on them so there's you know there's a, a bit of a paradox there's a bit of a chicken and egg problem there so yeah data and access to data is critical but how do you go about squeezing it out of governments is much more difficult um so we'll stay with you because it's a question that you touched on in your presentation uh but we'll we'll get back to it uh perhaps head on uh, it's a two-part question I'll, I'll let you decide if you want to answer the first part but i think we want an answer to the second one so would canada benefit from a two-tier system like in the uk and can our federation system even allow for a two-tier system to be established okay just a couple of observations here First, um, if you're aware of what's going on in the UK, you would probably not consider it to be a, a model that you'd want to follow. Um, <laughs> I recall uh, hearing an emergency room doctor in um, in the UK saying that a good shift is where nobody dies in your waiting room. So, mm, you know, you have to understand that the UK does have a private tier and it has not been at all useful. Um, you know, it, it certainly hasn't mitigated the kinds of problems that we're seeing here. In fact, there is evidence from Australia and other jurisdictions that when you introduce a private tier, the only way that a private tier can make a go of it is if people have to wait in the public system, right? So the business model of a private system is based on making the public system as bad as possible in order to attract new demand. And that's even beyond the staffing issues that we'd have to, to, to um, you know, worry about. So simply saying, open it up private tier, it's gonna solve our problems. There's never been a case where having a private tier increases capacity. It just makes things more difficult and adds all sorts of different dimensions. Again, with a private tier, the problem as you see in the States, not that I should compare too much with the States, but what you do see in the States with all the private healthcare is over treatment, right? Is that, you know, the if you have a private um, sector, um, if you are there for the profit, who's got the most money to squeeze it's the the healthy and the wealthy right so you're going to model your health care directed at those who have lots of money to play with you're going to give them their full body scans you're going to give them unnecessary back surgery because they're willing to pay for it right so it's simply having simply opening up a private sector um so it's a wild west and anything goes is certainly not going to be an answer now another response to this question is well what do you mean by two-tier system and i think that you know you could hardly say that we have a, a two-tier two -tier system in certain respects already so for example this very morning 
um, when I was getting my groceries, I went to the, the pharmacy counter and I said, look, I have a prescription and it uh, expired and oh my God, I don't want to have to go to my GP because it's going to be three months. And can you just, you know, is it within your scope of practice to give me this, pres to you know, uh, write up this prescription yourself? And he said, sure, I can do it. It's going to cost you 22 bucks. And I said, 22 bucks, fine. So that if that's not two tier, what is so? And uh, previously, I mean, I do have a GP, um, hard to access them. But again, with a prescription, I could say, well, um, I just want you to um, give me this prescription again that I've had for the past 20 years. And they'll say, well, yes, um, we'll, you can pick it up the counter, um, but it'll cost you 30 bucks. Right. So again, there are all these little kinds of, um, and, you know, they're all over the place. So if you've got the money, you already can get better access to, you know, the things that you need for healthcare. Um, so I'll end with the last. So th this this is the last question. Uh, it touches on um, what you both identified as one of the main issues currently, which is labor shortages. And it also um, touches on perhaps what people listening to us can do, because we're talking to the federal public service. So here's a question. How much leeway does Ottawa have with respect to medical labor shortages and easy access to health care in Canada? So what's the role of the federal public service, in a way, uh, to improve uh, access to health care and perhaps even uh, uh, help with the medical labor shortages? We've, we've touched on maybe perhaps... Uh, harmonizing uh, 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 some of the uh, qualifications across across jurisdictions. Maybe there's something else. So, uh, Hi, maybe I'll, I'll I'll start with you um, uh, on this question. Uh, it's, not an easy a, one. That's but, a great uh, constructive cre um, question, right? What can I do to help? Which is always a great thing to to ask. And and I I think um, part of it is just you know wherever you are, you're in the in the federal system. You're often in a touch point. It's not health necess necessarily, but health adjacent, as we were saying. And, and so something like um, looking at uh, technicians or technologists, just to recognize what is needed for the healthcare system right now. What, who are the types of people? And if, if, if we're still using, I know we're not using exactly the point system, but we're using a value-based, uh, uh, we're using a system for immigrants that looks at preferences. We're, pre we're preferring certain things over others. And so maybe the, maybe the preferred, um, uh, some of the preferred areas or some of the, some of the preferences given are to things um, related to the health field or, or related to people coming into things. So, so it, it, it's, it's required that the, that the field provides that information. You have to, they have to be forthcoming with that, but maybe there are creative things that say that, you know, we want to make sure that Nova Scotia isn't left out and that, that everybody isn't going to um, certain places. And maybe there's a, a similar type of thing with return of service where we, we have this with, with physicians where people are trained elsewhere, come back, do their training uh, here for licensure, and then they have return of service in underserviced areas. We've had this this happens. Um, this happens to a small extent. It's happened uh, for um, uh, once physicians come in to practice in rural Newfoundland, uh, rural Saskatchewan. There have been, you know, the, the, the famous. There have been some recent CBC articles to even on them. Uh, South African doctors that that fulfilled these these things, but it doesn't. Those are examples. But I think a concerted effort in that area. You need some. That's where you actually might have some partnership, where maybe it's the Atlantic provinces per se that look at um, that look at uh, wholesale um, immigration of people. It's often doctors which people gravitate to for a, for a town and, and such. But I would argue that it's you know you'll you'll get some more bang for your buck if you're looking at um, nurses uh, or um, or uh, other people, personal support workers, other people in that field that so it might not just be the immigration part, there might be some training involved with that, right? And and so I think this is what is required and, and everybody, you know, it's required for really someone to hold the clipboard and be in charge of the process. 
But I think the idea is that there's opportunity from different sectors of society, housing, other things, to be able to, to look into the to look into these things and contribute. Because uh, I I would say that, and I would argue that one of the biggest things hampering our um, our progress in the next five to ten years. Um, People say that the solution is immigration, and it very well might be. But hampering that solution is going to be our delivery. You know, housing obviously, but um, but healthcare is going to be, be. And then it's it's only it's only going to cause a rift between if if you're a person who doesn't have access to healthcare now, and there are more people coming in. It's sort of that you know the, the there are more people coming into that that tight area that you're only you're it's only going to get worse and make people um worse and more resentful of it thank you catherine so on the on the role of the federal uh civil service yeah uh, you know that that's a tough one because so much of the funding and delivery and the regulation is uh, done by the provinces um and of course you know the the, the, the federal role to a large extent is in uh, footing the bill for things like training. And, you know, just recently a new uh, medical school was announced for Cape Breton. And of course that was only possible with federal funds. Um, so that's a, it's actually a tougher question uh, than you might think um, in terms of just spitballing here, you know, it'd be nice to be able to getting back to the data question, it'd be nice to have a national interactive um, health Human Resource Atlas, where you have a geographical map and you can point and click and see what the various, um, you know, uh, staffing shortages are in any particular region, any particular point in time. We do that provincially. A lot of provinces do that already. But nice to have a federal map where you can look at the flows. I mean, we sort of have the data. We've got you know, Scott's Medical Atlas that Kaiha uses, or medical medical database um, that. So we do have the data, but it'd be nice to be able to, you know, put that data in a, in a much more user friendly form. But the one area I think that you know we could look at is the federal role in integrating Indigenous health governance. Um, you know, there's a lot happening in terms of bringing on stream, um, you know, Indigenous governance in in healthcare, and it actually differs substantially from province to province. And I think because of the presence of the federal government, you know, both uh, in uh, Indigenous services and its former role in, in Health Canada, uh, it's probably uniquely placed mm -hmm. to play a major role in coordinating uh, the discussion of Indigenous healthcare governance across Canada. So that is not such a patchwork. That's a that's that's a very interesting uh, very interesting point. Um, so I want to I want to end on this. I want to thank you both. I think this was really interesting, uh, very useful. I hope for people in audience. Um, uh, I want to highlight to everyone who's here that there will there will be another uh, of uh, event in this series on April eighteenth, which I guess will touch on some of what we touched here because it will be on digital federalism and open government policies. Uh, so we touch a lot on data here. Uh, so maybe broader in a, in a broader spectrum of data. Uh, so again, thank you all, um, and I hope you have a good day. Thank you.